Oh, all right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi everyone, welcome to the last talk of the conference. And uh, thanks uh, for sticking around. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hajiabadi and I want to tell you uh, about uh, a joint piece of work with Sanjom Gark on a construction of trapdoor function from the computational Diffie-Hulman assumption. Okay, so trapdoor functions, you have heard about them probably a lot during this conference. Um, they are a fundamental primitive in crypto. They were first uh, introduced in a landmark, landmark paper by uh, Diffie and Hillman in 1976, which sort of uh, developed the foundations of what we now call public key crypto. So another fundamental primitive in uh, cryptography is uh, public key encryption that was first designed in the famous RSA paper um, uh, in 1970s. And, um, they were, and they were later rigorously defined by um, uh, Goldwasser and Mickley in 1982. So uh, in order for me to uh, set up the stage and notation for this talk, let me quickly go over um, these two notions. I'm sure that all of you are uh, familiar with, but just to uh, set up the notation. <clears throat> uh, public encryption, uh, as you all know, uh, as, uh, as you all know uh, is given by three algorithms, G, E, and D. Uh, the key generation, the encryption, and the decryption algorithm, where the key generation algorithm gives us a public key and secret key, and you can use the encryption algorithm to encrypt a plain text message M to a public key PK using some randomness R to get a ciphertext C. And you can use the decryption algorithm to decrypt the ciphertext if you, if you have the right secret key. Uh, in terms of security, we have the basic notion of semantic security, which says that uh, encryptions of any two uh, plain text should be computationally uh, indistinguishable. Now, uh, trapdoor functions are defined exactly like public encryption with the only difference that the encryption algorithm that we now call the evaluation algorithm does not take as input any randomness, okay? So this means that uh, the decryption algorithm that we now call the inversion algorithm can recover the entire input uh, to the, to the uh, trapdoor function evaluation algorithm. And since we make use of no randomness, we cannot achieve uh, semantic security, but we should uh, settle for something weaker. Uh, in particular, the one way this notion says that uh, a randomly chosen function from the family should be one way. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, a main distinctive feature of trapdoor functions is that um, no randomness is used in the evaluation algorithm. Uh, in terms of the relationship between these two notions, we know by classical results that trapdoor functions imply the existence of uh, public encryption. As for the other direction, uh, we know that it's impossible with respect to black box reductions. Okay, so uh, in particular, what this impossibility result says is that um, uh, techniques that generically give us public encryption may not be sufficient for trapdoor functions if we are uh, working with uh, black box uh, reductions, which are most of the techniques uh, in uh, crypto. So I want you uh, to remember this point because I want to come back to it later. All right, so um, you might ask that we have public encryption, it's pretty useful, why do we care about uh, uh, trapdoor functions, are they a theoretical object that people want to build out of uh, uh, curiosity or do we have any applications uh, of this notion? So let me motivate this notion a little bit. Suppose we have a trapdoor function and imagine we have two users, Alice and Bob, where Alice has two index keys, IK1 and IK2, and suppose that Bob has both these keys plus a trapdoor key for IK1, okay? Uh, what is happening is that Alice is sending two image points, Y1 and Y2, to Bob, which were made with respect to index keys IK1 and IK2, and she wants to convince Bob that these two image points correspond to the same input. Okay. So the question is how Alice can do this. Does she need to provide some kind of proof for Bob in order for Bob to check for this, or can Bob do it um, by himself? So it turns out that it turns out since we deal with trapdoor functions which make use of no randomness, this is easy for Bob to check uh, himself. Namely, Bob can, use, can make use of his knowledge of TK1 to recover X1, and then he can check whether F of uh, IK2 comma X1 gives us uh, Y2 or not. This is not, th this is not a toy example. Uh, in fact, this is the main reason behind the success of building uh, CCA to secure public encryption schemes from, uh, in a black box way from various forms of uh, trapdoor functions. Uh, in contrast, when you think about the same situation, but when we use public encryption, this is difficult to do because in general, it is difficult to check whether two ciphertexts are uh, encrypting the same plain text. You need uh, non-interactive zero knowledge tools. 
uh, to do this. And when you use NISIC in a protocol, the protocol will be non-black box and will not be efficient. Okay, so this is one uh, important uh, property of trapdoor functions. So, so far we knew how to build trapdoor functions from a very small set of assumptions, which are limited to factoring DDH and uh, LWE. And in fact, there's a very big gap from the set of assumptions that give us public encryption. Uh, in our work, we, show how to, we showed how to build uh, TDFs from the computational Diffie-Hillman assumption. And uh, this question has been open for more than uh, 30 years. Okay, so let me uh, review the notion of CDH and the related notion of DDH. Uh, both these assumptions are defined with respect to a group G. Uh, the CDH assumption says that from G, G to the X, and G to the Y, it is hard to compute G to the power of X times Y, where G is the random generator of the group, and X and Y are random exponents. And the DDH assumption says that the joint distribution of G, G to the X, G to the Y, and G to the X times Y is pseudo-random. Okay, so uh, you might ask that why do we care about building uh, TDFs from the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption? The answer is very simple, because CDH uh, is a weaker and more trustable assumption. Uh, in fact, we have examples of groups which are uh, plausibly CDH hard, but are provably not DDH hard. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about the challenges that one would face when wanting to build chapter functions from Diffie-Hellman related assumptions. In general, this is not a trivial task, and the, and the short answer for this is that all these Diffie-Hellman related assumptions rely on the discrete log problem, and we don't have a generic trapdoor for the discrete log function. So to see uh, how this makes things more difficult, let's uh, try to solve an easier problem. Let's try to build a trapdoor function from DDH. Okay? So from DDH, uh, we know how to build public encryption, so let's try to de-randomize um, uh, LGOML encryption, which is a CPA secure public encryption based, based on DDH. So remember that um, uh, Elgamal works as follows. The secret key is a random exponent alpha, and uh, the public key is G to the alpha, where G is a generator. And if you want to encrypt uh, a group element M, you raise G to the power of R, and you also raise the public key to the power of R, and multiply it with M. Okay? Now you can see that if you have the secret key alpha, you can easily recover M, which is the plain text, but you cannot recover R. And we cannot recover R is not because we are not uh, smart enough to recover R. We, can, we have a very good reason that why we cannot uh, recover R. Why we cannot recover R. Because recovering R is as hard as solving the discrete log problem. Okay? So the take home message that I want you to take from this slide is that if you want to design a trapdoor function based on uh, Diffie Hellman related assumptions, you should not perform. Uh, exponentiations in the evaluation algorithm. Because for the exponentiation function, we don't know a trapdoor. Okay, so with this intuition in mind, let's, uh, let me review how the previous work managed to build a trapdoor function from the DDH assumption. Okay, so this was first built by Parker and Waters, uh, and um, it was simplified by some other paper. Um, uh, I just realized that uh, they don't have the most updated version uh, of my slides, okay. Um, so um, the chapter function works as follow. Uh, the injective key of the TDF is G to the M, where M is a random invertible matrix uh, of exponents. And the G to the M means G to the first element, G to the second element, and so on. And the, the trapdoor key is M inverse. Okay? Now you can see that for the evaluation algorithm, if you have G to the M, and if you have an input X, uh, which, which is given to you as a, um, uh, as a row vector, you can perform linear, al uh, linear algebra in the exponent to compute g to the power of m times x transpose. Okay? Now, if you have the trapdoor key, which is m inverse, from, from the image input y, you can very easily compute x bit by bit, where uh, the ith bit is given as g to the xi. Okay? So when we want to prove that this trapdoor function is one way, we need to rely on this rank indistinguishability property, which is implied by DDH, which says that 
the distribution of g to the m is computationally indistinguishable from g to the m prime, where m is a random invertible matrix and m prime is a low rank random matrix. Okay. This property can be proved based on DDH, but it cannot be proved based on CDH. The main reason is that when you want to prove uh, this property, one way or another, you should reason um, about a homomorphic property of the underlying hardcore function. And we don't have such a property based on CDH. So we do not really have any techniques that uh, give us uh, trapdoor functions based on CDH. So uh, this is what we do uh, in our work. We give the first construction of trapdoor functions from the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption. So, uh, our uh, our um, methodology in a very high level uh, involves de-randomizing a, a specific class of public encryption schemes. Okay? So what I'm going to do is that I will first uh, tell you what this notion is, which is the class of public encryption schemes that we de-randomize. Uh, we call it recyclable targeted key encapsulation schemes. Um, we actually called it something else in the paper. I'm calling it this way in the stock. Um, uh, this notion combines properties from some previous work, from, uh, from a piece of work of Sanjom and Deutling last year, and from a paper of uh, Bellotta et al. from 2003. So I will tell you what this notion is, and then I will show you how we can build uh, trapdoor functions from this notion. And I will refer you to the paper uh, on how we can build this notion from CDH. Okay. So let me tell you what uh, recyclable targeted KIM is. So it's a kind of um, key encapsulation mechanism enhanced with some property, uh, with some uh, properties. So let's review the notion of KIM. Uh, a KIM scheme is defined exactly like a public encryption scheme with the only difference that the encapsulation algorithm does not take as input any plain text message M. Uh, it takes as input a public key P, PK and some randomness R, and it gives us a cipher text C, which is encapsulating in some sense uh, a key E, okay? So it is encapsulating in the sense that if you have the right secret key, you can derive the value of E from C, all right? So um, in my talk, I'm always going to assume that E is a single bit. All right, so this is the notion of Kim. Now let me tell you what uh, these two properties mean. Let's start with the targeting uh, property. Uh, what it says is that the input to the encapsulation algorithm contains two, ne uh, two new values, an uh, index, uh, a target index i, and a target bit b. Okay, so the output is the same as before. It's a ciphertext and uh, a key value e. Now, what is going to happen is that in order for you to be able to decrypt not only should you come up with the valid secret key for PK, but that secret key should have the property that its i bit is b, okay? So i and b were, were specified in the encapsulation phase. So you might ask that what will happen if I have a secret key that is valid relative to PK, but its i bit is not b? This brings me to the security notion that says that even if you have the secret key, but if you are given uh, and in consistently formed ciphertext CT, you cannot distinguish the true value of E from a totally random bit. Okay. Now, the recyclability property uh, in a very high level says that the ciphertext, uh, on the ciphertext uh, output part of the, um, of the encapsulation algorithm does not depend on the, uh, on the given public key. Uh, it only depends on a public parameter, which is uh, the same across all public keys. Okay, now you can see that I have, um, uh, I have specified the outputs of E as E1 and E2, and I, and I didn't put PK as an input to E1, because uh, uh, E1 is independent of PK. Okay, so the, these are the two properties, and this concludes uh, the notion of recyclable targeted CAM. Now, this picture summarizes the two properties that I just told you uh, about. Um, whenever we want to build a trapdoor function from any assumption, one way or another, we should show two different deterministic ways of reaching the same output, okay? And the way that this is uh, 
uh, enabled in our setting is that you can drive the value of E in, in two different ways, either by applying the algorithm E2 to a public key PK and uh, a randomness value R, or by applying the algorithm D to a ciphertext which uses that randomness value R and to a secret key which is consistent uh, with this ciphertext. So with this intuition in mind, let me give you a version of our chapter function of our chapter functions which, which uh, allows us to recover the first bit uh, of the input. All right, so uh, what we are going to do is that the index key uh, of my chapter function consists of two chem ciphertexts and uh, the trapdoor key contains the underlying randomness values. Okay, um, the input to the trapdoor function is the secret key SK of the chem scheme. And what we are going to do is that we are going to first compute the corresponding public key. And then depending on, uh, depending on the value of the first bit of SK, uh, I'm going to apply the algorithm D to either CT1 or uh, CT prime one. Remember that I told you that we can apply the algorithm D to a ciphertext which is consistent uh, with the ciphertext, uh, to a ciphertext which is consistent with the secret key. Okay, the, uh, the, uh, the part that I've, uh, that I've marked with uh, orange comes from the property that I told you in the previous slide. Now, if you want to invert, you have all the randomness values, you can form both these um, E2 values, and you can check for a match, okay? So this allows us to recover uh, the first bits of SK with probability one half. But this is not a problem because you can repeat this process in parallel to amplify correctness. So this is not a problem, but we have a problem. When we want to prove security, we will not be able to prove uh, security. The main reason is that uh, the security property of the chemist scheme that I told you about does, uh, does not guarantee that we can uh, hide um, the value uh, of the target bit B. That this is the main uh, challenge that we'll have. Uh, the fix that we give to this problem is very easy, and that is uh, based on this idea that we put a random bit uh, in the input of the trapdoor function, and that random bit is going to be placed in the output in the place where we cannot uh, apply the algorithm D. Now, in a little bit more detail, in a much more detail, <laughs> okay, so uh, the key generation algorithm is exactly like before. Now, the only difference is that uh, in the evaluation algorithm, I have a new bit B1, and the way that I'm going to uh, form the output is that I will uh, apply the algorithm D to one of the, to one of the two ciphertexts. I can apply it to only one ciphertext, and for, the, and, and for the position that I cannot apply D, I will put uh, the bit B1, which is, which, is, which is coming from the input. This magically uh, solves the problem. And if you want to know how it solves the problem, I will refer you to the paper. Okay, so, uh, so I gave you a construction that allows us to recover the first bits uh, of the input. You can uh, do the same idea to recover all the bits uh, of the inputs in a secure manner. All right, so let me conclude. Uh, we gave a construction of trapdoor functions from the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption. Uh, as a couple of uh, open problems, we would like to know whether we can build more uh, advanced forms of TDFs from the CDH assumption, like uh, lossy chapdoor chap functions. And as a second open problem, which I think is very interesting, it is um, whether, uh, whether we can build or separate uh, chapdoor permutations from a CDH or DDH. Thank you very much. <laughs>